Okay. So yes, um, so I've worked for Wessex Archaeology and for the past 20 years, we've been working with clients across a variety of um, marine sectors um, to effectively manage the heritage risk on their developments. And I, although I'm the one presenting, this is very much based on the work of many colleagues at Wessex. So over the past two days, um, we've seen a lot of reference to industry data and how that's been used for research. But I'm going to sort of provide a view from the inside, from within that commercial planning system. So first, I'll provide a little bit of an overview to the commercial sector and its evolution, um, and then look at two examples off the coast of East Anglia, um, progressively moving further offshore, and it does include Area 240. Um, but really illustrating how we've worked with clients, geologists and engineers to enhance our understanding of these paleo landscapes and prehistory. And I'll talk a bit about the middle Paleolithic, uh, sorry, middle Pleistocene, late Pleistocene, and also the Holocene sediments. And then I'll touch at the end on some of the challenges and potential future opportunities associated um, with the assessment of paleo landscapes within the commercial sector. So over the last 20 years, we've seen a massive increase in offshore development around the UK. And this has provided us huge opportunity to examine areas of the seafloor in deeper waters and further from the coastline that was previously possible. So back in 1996, if we're looking at the offshore wind farm industry, um, that was with the first applications, first thoughts for offshore wind were. And in 2000, two turbines um, were erected. Now, 20 years on, we've got a lot of the round three wind farm areas that are 100 turbines plus. Huge amounts of development. But it's not just the offshore wind. There's aggregate dredging, ports and harbours, and also interconnector cables, which give us um, sort of slices across this, uh, the seabed, as well as tidal schemes and um, communication, telecommunication cables. So the assessment of marine archaeology, uh, which includes shipwrecks, aircraft and paleo landscapes, forms an integral part of the planning process in the UK. And this is a pretty horrible diagram, but it shows that there's over 200 pieces of international European and English legislation giving protection to the marine environment and cultural heritage um, form part of this, as shown in red. And this covers both planning policy, but also specific site protection. And this planning and consenting process is the responsibility of the UK government via the MMO, the Marine Management Organisation, in consultation with curatorial bodies such as Historic England for English Waters, who act as their primary advisor. And this has also given rise to a series of guidance documents for offshore developers in how to interact with the historic environment and engage with archaeologists. And of course, as we've seen over the past two days, the geophysical and geotechnical data are our primary sources. But for commercial projects, it's important to, to recognise that the acquired data is multi-purpose. So it's not collected solely for archaeological assessment, but it's collected to characterise site conditions. So it's used by geologists, design engineers, as well as benthic ecologists and archaeologists. And I think over the past, certainly the past 10 years, archaeology has become embedded within that planning um, process. So our involvement with archaeologists has improved and we're now often involved a lot earlier on. So we're actually helping design the surveys and design where geotechnical data is collected. Um, but it is very much a sense of collect once, use many times. So we manage the archaeology throughout the life cycle of the development from pre-planning right the way through to decommissioning. And this is with the aim of providing advice on archaeological potential, its significance, and also the mitigation of the impact um, of the development on the cultural heritage resource. So that is the main focus of all our, um, our assessments. And as can be seen on the map on the right, and we've seen in other, sli uh, other slides in talks, the actual coverage of study areas is quite considerable, particularly in the Channel area and the Southern North Sea. Um, and admittedly, a lot of, you know, the resolution of the data um, can vary greatly within these, but still a vast, vast amount of data. And these um, are obviously supplemented by data from the likes of the North Sea Paleo Landscape Project and also the aggregate levy funded regional environmental characterization regions. But it's clear after these past two days that I need to redraw my map somewhat. 
But a further industry initiative of note and sort of ties in with what Rachel's just been talking is the recording of physical archaeological finds, um, including those relating to prehistory. And this stems back to 2003, where the British Marine Aggregate Producers Association, BMAPA and English Heritage, um, as was, um, produced a guidance note for assessing, evaluating, mitigating and monitoring the effects of marine aggregate dredging. And this was followed in 2005 with the introduction of a protocol for reporting finds of archaeological interest. And this was for um, applicable to all BMAPA members and to all the licensees covering wharfs, vessels and production license areas. And under this protocol, archaeological material discovered was then reported through an implementation service. And this is supported and continues to be supported and promoted to those working in the industry through an awareness programme. And it is an exemplar um, project of getting people involved and getting them interested. Um, and that fuels more reporting and, um, and better finds, really. And since 2014, a similar approach has been undertaken for the offshore wind farm industry. Now, there's a lot less chance of actually recovering finds, although a certain some level of diving does occur but it's also a way of, of reporting finds or, or particular sediments on the seabed that um, are observed via ROVs in deeper waters. So for my first first ex, uh, case study I'm, I am going to stick with um, the aggregate industry and talk a little about Area 240 in the Paleo Yar. Um, I know that Rachel's already mentioned it, um, but it is a good example of where an industry-led response for a regional issue regarding significant archaeological finds has worked through a collaborative approach of involvement of the regulator and archaeologists. So Area 240 is associated um, off Great Yarmouth. It's, uh, it's 11k from the coast in about 30 metres water depth. And the dredge material from there is... Um, is landed at its um, Flushing Wharf over in the Netherlands. And as Rachel mentioned, um, in the winter of 2007-2008, gravel extracted from this area yielded 88 worked flint artefacts, including 33 hand axes and over 100 um, fragments of faunal remains. And this was discovered in the aggregate um, outsized pile, um, which is shown here, which is basically everything over um, 63 millimetres um, size wise. And this was um, discovered by local archaeologists um, and facilitated by the local wharf manager. And here are just some of the finds. And once it was established that the material had been dredged from 55,000 tonnes um, of sediment from Area 240, which is shown in the track lines in blue on the map, um, Hansen Aggregate Marine Limited voluntarily placed a protective exclusion zone around that part of the seabed from which the flints were dredged. And this then led on to a, um, a long term project that in some ways is still ongoing today, in which um, a sort of an iterative project was developed um, with the aims really of understanding the geological context, recovering further archaeological material and improving the understanding of the, of the regional um, aspect of it, as well as developing strategies for the management and mitigation of this resource as this continues as, a, a, as an aggregate extraction area. So initially it was focused on Area 240 and this allowed us to, um, to come up with a stratigraphic framework for the area. And, and this really showed um, development from the late Anglian right the way through to the Holocene. And in terms of the flints, um, flint finds themselves, the important bit is shown in red, which is sort of the uh, infill of the channel and development of a floodplain that covers most of the area um, during MIS 8 and 7. And that combi combined with Dimitri de Loeca's um, work looking at the flints themselves, put this as a early middle Paleolithic site based on a floodplain um, of a channel um, which runs sort of uh, west to east. And the other things to note just for later on in my talk really are that um, 
following on from, from the um, floodplain deposits, we then had reactivation and infill of the channel, um, uh, probably early Devensian um, time in MIS 5D, some tantalizing OSL data relating to um, MIS 3, and then the development of an early Holocene channel, which runs north to south through the area um, and partial infill with salt marsh deposits. And I'll come back to them when I move on to the second case study. But it was the importance of the recovery of these early middle Paleolithic artifacts. Um, it was noted by the, uh, the aggregate industry um, and acknowledged by them that we couldn't look at this in isolation, that it affected the mitigation and management of the entire block. And this led on to a further piece of work which combined the onshore and the offshore um, available data and allowed us to effectively map the paleo yar from onshore right the way off to just shy of um, the break point, which is at 40 kilometers um, offshore. And we do have um, a large gap. And as, uh, as, as was indicated with the uh, questions in the last talk, um, we have no data there because that's where the large sandbanks are. And the geophysics data within that area just can't penetrate um, that area um, uh, through the sandbanks to, for us to clearly see the, uh, the limits of the floodplain beneath. But as part of this as well, we also worked with Hansen and the licensee to trial archaeological monitoring of aggregate dredging activity. And we tried this um, on board a dredging vessel, um, sort of field walking on the back of a boat, which was successful, but not overly sustainable, um, but also at the wharf as well. And the aim was to assess the potential mitigation strategies with regards to the future long term aggregate licensing applications um, within an area of known archaeology. And this hadn't been developed previous to this. So further flint artifacts, um, including further three hand axes, were recovered. And this showed us that the artifactual material was present both within the vicinity of the original finds, but was also more widespread within the area. And monitoring at the wharf proved the most useful strategy. And this has actually since been adopted throughout the aggregate block and still continues to today. So as, as working with Anthony Firth of Fjorda, um, a series of hypotheses were made um, in order to address remaining uncertainties concerning uh, the association between these artifacts and the environment from which they were found. And these are tested through periodic monitoring and the monitoring is, site, uh, is area specific, so it depends on what sediments are there, how many samples um, the licensee takes and how often we monitor it. Um, and we've also more recently um, assessed more recently acquired cores as well, comparing these to known dredging activity and effectively retesting our interpretation for the area. Um, and we've continued to find flint and faunal remains um, within the area shown by the red stars, which show that there is material um, more widespread within the area. But all of this work has only been possible through that industry-led response um, to this issue. Um, but the second example is moving on to a larger scale development, and this is situated further offshore again, um, so approximately 60 to 100 kilometres from the coast. And this is for the Norfolk um, Vanguard and Boreas wind farms. And it's um, thanks to Vattenfall, um, the developer, um, that I can present the, some of these results here today. And again, this is situated to the south of the last glacial limit, which is important in terms of preservation of the late Pleistocene sediments and associated features, which I'll show you. So working on large scale projects also allows collaboration with geologists and engineers um, and this has enhanced our understanding um, within the inevitable time constraints of a commercial project. And I think it's fair to say that in the early days, um, archaeology was undertaken very much in isolation. Um, and it was, yes, it was something that um, developers had to deal with, but it was it was it was an aside. Um, whereas that's not the case now. And where often archaeologists are part of that project delivery team. And this does vary between developers, um, but the more that the archaeologists are um, embedded within that, the better the results um, that, that we can get. And I'll show you an example of this in a moment. 
So in terms of volumes of data, um, we use geophysical um, data to, and geotechnical data to characterize um, the shallow subsurface to identify features of, of archaeological interest. And so the data um, we looked at, it was 100% coverage of bathymetry data and sub-bottom profile aligns at um, 100 meter line spacing. And there's also a, you know, a large number of cores, but you know, there's never really enough. Um, and the cores were taken for engineering purposes, um, but there were some that were targeting um, archaeology. And of those 10 cores were taken forward um, to be assessed, um, both as part of a dating strategy, um, as, as well as looking at the paleoenvironmental um, assessment. So these just show some of the detailed um, results. And what we have in the area is that we have um, brown bank formation deposits um, and associated gas blanking, um, indicating the breakdown of organic matter within that the brown bank channel features. Um, we then overlying that we have a series of well-preserved um, buried dunes, um, which have formed in the terrestrial environment. Um, and these can be shown here. And Sorry, and of these dunes, we're not sure whether these are terrestrial environment um, during subaerial exposure or whether these are submerged dunes, um, but impressive um, preservation, um, both here and in other parts of the site. Um, and we've also identified um, it's around about 85 kilometers squared area um, of, uh, of preserved peat um, shown in green. And these are dissected by a number of channels um, observed in the north of the site. So here we can see high amplitude reflectors, um, just sort of high amplitude reflectors here, and then cut by channel, um, channel features uh, that we've got some nice detail of infill, and then they are overfilled by uh, modern marine sediment on top. And we only see the peat and the channels um, within the north of the area. And there does seem to be an elevation control affecting um, the preservation um, of, the, of these sort of these Holocene um, features. So based on the initial characterization, um, a series of research questions were posed, um, and these were the focus of the assessment and analysis of the core data. And we know that the peak formation um, commenced um, so I'll show you one of the cores. Um, we know across the site that the peat formation uh, commenced at the start of the Holocene um, and created an extensive wetland environment in and around which a network of fluvial channels. And the site became shortly um, submerged shortly after around uh, 9,700 Cal BP. And the landscape was characterized by active river systems with reed and fen wetlands um, forming along the margins open grassland, um, and as climate warmed in the early Holocene, woodland remained relatively open, but became then dominated by pine, later hazel, and then some oak and elm. And under rising sea level conditions, the coastline encroached, giving way to salt marsh and tidal flats before the final inundation. We've also got presence of charcoal within the peat deposits, um, and that's evidence of repeated fire events uh, during the early Holocene, although it's not possible to establish if these were caused by human activity. Um, but a lot of similarities to um, the talk that Ruth um, um, gave yesterday with regards to um, peats of the similar age further to the east in, in Dutch waters associated with the Brown Bank Ridge. And the second series of questions uh, relate to the um, depositional history of the Brown Bank Formation, which having undertaken the work on Area 240, um, as, as great as the, um, the, the Salian floodplain deposits were, there was always some questions resulting from that and also from the East Coast REC with regards to um, the Brown Bank Formation and what impact would that have relating to the presence or absence of um, hominins in Britain during the Middle Paleolithic? So this is taken from, um, from the original BGS mapping, which shows um, that the Brown Bank Formation is an extensive distinct deposit in the Southern North Sea covering around 1,000 um, kilometres squared. 
And the brown bank formation is characterized by a series of north-south trending channels in the west and then a broad basin in the east that extends into the Dutch sector. And the dates were always um, always looked at that early Devensian, so sort of around MIS-5D, um, around the 110,000 years ago. But dating evidence from, um, from the REC and ARI 240s, as well as this project, collectively indicate gradual deposition um, over the duration of the early Devensian, um, a period of sort of overall cooling and climatic instability characterized by cold and warm subperiods to around about 57,000 years ago when sea levels fell low enough to fully expose um, this region. And this is where collaborating with geologists and engineers and, and their data analysis has allowed further understanding and further, um, further assessment of, of the brown bank formation and what it might mean um, in an archaeological sense. So a 3D ground model um, was generated for turbine foundation purposes and was produced based on sediment strength values um, within the stratigraphy. But in this case, the stratigraphic change coincided with layer of interest um, from our perspective, um, which is the, the base of the brown bank formation, which it can be seen on the, uh, on the top as the faint yellow line there. Um, so on this, um, brown is high ground and blue is low. And this was only taken for the two of the northern sites. But by applying knowledge of sea level curves close to the coast, we were able to reconstruct potential landscape configurations at different times. So we looked at two, um, two scenarios. Um, the first to MIS-5D, so around about the uh, 105 to 115,000 um, years ago, where uh, water depths were around minus 48 uh, meters. And we've put an arbitrary um, sort of two meter, um, two meter boundary on, on um, to look at the intertide difference between marine, intertidal and terrestrial landscapes. But the results show a large proportion of the, of the, um, of the site would have been exposed um, particularly to the north and to the east. Um, with the exception in the southeast, where there's a large channel feature that would have remained flooded despite the so low sea level. And this channel may have formed an estuary or be part of a wider embayment um, or a restricted lagoon if a barrier existed to protect it. And in the southwest of the project area, there are a series of localised isolated basins within the, um, the landscape. And uh, for scenario B, um, we, we looked at MIS-5B, um, uh, also another low stand. So this is between um, 84 to 92,000 years ago, uh, where water depths were at 42 um, metres below today. And this suggests that the southern part of the site would have been um, submerged during this time, with exposed areas would have been low-lying land, possibly creating a series of small islands and irregular coastlines. But the results suggest that the brown bank embayment was a prominent feature in the southern North Sea during the early Devensian, um, corresponding to a period of hiatus in the British archaeological record. And it's, it, you know, perhaps this created a significant geographic barrier to migration pathways in this region and may part explain the absence of, uh, of hominins from Britain during MIS 6 to 4. Although, as was mentioned previously, um, you know, there is some evidence of potential cause at, at, at Dartford. So just my last, last slide, really. Um, these two examples show different aspects of commercial archaeology. Um, we're working with developers, geologists and engineers, help increase our knowledge and understanding. And, but there are challenges associated with working um, in the commercial, commercial world. So individual work packages, um, such as the review of geophysical data and core logging, they, they have fast turnarounds, so it can be very short term, but they can also, but the actual life cycle of the project can be over 10 years. So this means that outputs in terms of published work um, or integration of, of work occur at the end, so there's a large lag time. And although these technical reports are available, um, they can be difficult to find unless you know where to look and where they're published. 
And the data is commercially sensitive, making it difficult to access, although this is changing and we are seeing much more involvement of academia in the process. But we do need a mechanism to feed this work into the public and academic sectors throughout the life cycle of the project. But there are lots of opportunities. There is going to be more offshore wind with the government legally committed to achieving net zero by 2050. Um, there is major investment in the amount of physical and geotechnical data and also different types. So we're seeing much more 3D or um, parametric data now than previously. And we have got more developer engagement with academia. But there is also the opportunity for academia to engage with those of us undertaking commercial work as well. And that. So thanks to the companies that we've worked with um, that have associated with this, but also to my many, many colleagues um, at Wessex Archaeology who have worked and continue to work um, on these projects. <laughs>